<laughs> it's not a very easy task. Uh, it's often like herding cats. But I would say just, you know, the Wisconsin example is, you know, in all the issues I've worked on, which are many, I was in the environmental movement for a long time, this, you know, the Wisconsin moment was the, the most cohesive, effective, sort of quick mobilization of the whole progressive community that I've seen, you know, in a long time, both from, you know, national groups working together, whether it's, you know, the unions and their table interfacing with, you know, people like us at the Center for American Progress and other progressive voices, uh, people like the PCCC. So working together at that level, at the national level, some extraordinary work on the ground, a lot of it driven, obviously, by social media, Twitter, uh, local blogs, uh, you know, national blogs, and those two things being really well integrated. So I think, you know, for something that happened virtually overnight, um, it was a pretty amazing display of effective, you know, work within the progressive community to get the right message out. And then about the message, I would say, you know, it was, it was very satisfying, I think, for me to see, you know, people come in to help the unions and to see us come together on a message that was not about, you know, just saving the unions or about the sort of nitty gritty of what, you know, the budget bill did or what this bill in Ohio or this bill in Indiana was going to do, but we really put forth an effective message that was, you know, broad, it was about an attack on workers, an attack on the middle class, and who was behind it, you know, these corporate interests that we've all become so familiar with. And so I think the effectiveness of that message has served, you know, a couple purposes, both obviously it was effective at the time, we, you know, broadened our story, gotten it out, but it's allowed us to kind of move forward, both in Wisconsin and elsewhere, on different fights, but that are very closely related. So now, you know, we're having these recall elections, those are going to be made a lot about, you know, the Paul Ryan budget. So we're kind of bringing those two fights together. You know, new and different allies. You know, Emily's List, I was very excited, you know, earlier this week when they announced that they were going to be playing in the recalls. So I think if we hadn't had that sort of broad-based, effective message, it wouldn't have been as easy for people beyond the labor movement to really get involved um, with this very important fight. So, and then thirdly, I would say, the, about the message is that, you know, the corporate special interests, it was just amazing to me, you know, Think Progress, we've been banging away for years on the coast, and you know, how evil the Koch brothers are, and you know, what they're funding, what they're doing, but I was just blown away, frankly, by the fact that every time you turned on MSNBC, you'd have a sign, and they would all say, you know, have some Koch reference to it. You know, Dave Weigel wrote a piece, he found some retiree, that had printed out Think Progress posts about the Koch brothers and was handing them out, you know, to Madison, which is just, it was obviously very gratifying, but it's just, you know, speaks to finally identifying, you know, whether it's the for Growth, who I saw was running ads on Minneapolis TV against one of the Democrats running the recall, getting that message out, exposing some of the other actors, the Bradley Foundation, who, you know, is all tied up with John Birch Society, people, you know, people don't hear a lot about, I think, that fight in Wisconsin and elsewhere helped galvanize, you know, who these people are, why they're doing what they're doing, and what they're doing. And then just quickly, sort of as a case study, uh, wanted to go through just an example of how the right-wing infrastructure works at the state level. Uh, you know, we had a long time, you know, three decades, the right built up heritage and AI and all this infrastructure at the national level that, you know, we at the Center for American Progress would like to think we're finally, you know, providing a pretty effective counterweight to but it's happening all over again at the state level with the infrastructure the right is building, and we're, I think, way behind the eight ball on that one. And it's, uh, you know, great you know, work is being done by a lot of laws at the state level, but still can't, you know, match exactly what the right's putting into it. So the example I'm just gonna bring up, and this is one of the, the biggest stories from the right to break through, is the fake doctor's notes story. And to understand exactly where that came from, it was first promoted by uh, something called the MacIver News Service. And what was the fake, the fake doctor's notes? The fake doctor's notes were, you know, there were doctors, medical students, residents uh, from the University of Wisconsin handing out, you know, they were just signing doctor's notes essentially for teachers who were, you know, not going to work and were demonstrating in medicine. So, uh, you know, what this MacIver News Service, which is part of the MacIver Institute, which is basically a fake think tank supported by the Cobes, very closely aligned with Heritage. Um, there are these in many, many, many states. Has this, you know, has Twitter feed, YouTube, very simple. It's not a real news organization. You know, had a video, put up the video of, you know, these, you know someone getting, just walking up and getting a doctor's note from these, you know, 
doctors, put the video up, started furiously tweeting about it. Uh, within two and a half hours, Fox broke in with a news alert about these, you know, fake sick notes. The AP had a story by, you know, 1025 the next day. Uh, you know, two days later, Fox is still talking about it. Kabuto had on uh, someone from MacIver to talk about it, who then took credit for it. You know, Breitbart TV comes in, someone out of state is, you know, harassing the crowd about this. The story just gets bigger, bigger, bigger. Investigations are launched. Um, and, you know, it was a real impediment, I think, to, to our message for a couple of days. And of course, you dig a little deeper, you know, the president of the MacIver Institute is a Breitbart blogger, you know, so it's just this kind of cross-pollination that they're building out there that, you know, just to see this one sort of nonsense <coughs> story go from zero to 100 in a matter of two hours and then stick around for literally weeks. I mean, there was still, I blasted a clip search about a month ago, and there were still clips coming up every week. Now we get about that. Um. Um, so, it sounds like they're on a party over there. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else can hear it, but, um... That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> they might over here and make it even more fun. Um, 